Hello again, my name is Mr Beasley and first of all thank you for choosing to watch what I think is the most comprehensive and accurate analysis of Anthem for Doomed Youth out there. Anthem for Doomed Youth was probably written in 1917 when Wilfred Owen was a patient at Craig Lockhart Hospital recovering from shell shock. There he met the poet Siegfried Sassoon who helped edit some of Owen's early drafts. It was Sassoon, for example, who turned Owen's original title for the poem from Anthem for Dead Youth to Anthem for Doomed Youth. The assonance, which is this repetition of the vowel sound, elongating the words and giving the title a really sad and mournful tone. The poem is an elegy, which means that it's a sad poem written to express sorrow for someone's death, but it's also written in the form of a Shakespearean sonnet, which means the rhymes are organised into three groups of four, like this. With a rhyming couplet to finish. The poem is about the rituals that might take place at someone's funeral. You know, things like church bells and choirs, prayers, candles, flowers, and that sense of saying goodbye to a loved one. But Owen's point in this poem is that the soldiers on the battlefield of World War I were denied all of this. They died in such large numbers and with such violence and brutality that many of the dead were never even recovered, let alone identified and buried in a respectful way. The poem begins by asking a question. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Passing bells are bells rung to announce that someone has died. And so the question asks, what bells will be rung to announce the death of soldiers killed fighting for their country? And Owen answers this question himself by saying, only the monstrous anger of the guns in line two. The sound of gunfire is the last noise that these soldiers will hear. And the fact that this is described with the phrase monstrous anger has a couple of interesting effects. First of all, it personifies the guns to make them collectively sound like a huge hostile monster attacking the soldiers. But also the adjective monstrous means evil or abominable, which feeds into Wilfred Owen's broader themes about the appalling nature of war. The word only is repeated at the beginning of line three, and in this context it means just or no more than. And this is Owen further adding to his answer to the question set up in the first line, what sounds will be heard to announce the death of soldiers killed on the battlefield? No more than the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle which patters out or silences the final prayers, orisons, of the dying men. The word patter, which I've circled here, is really interesting to look at in a bit more detail because of the depth of meanings being conveyed. Patter can mean the rapid, meaningless chatter of people. So the effect here might once again be to personify the sound of the guns and make their glib, chattering sound muffle the men's prayers, cancelling them out. But patter also has a more archaic meaning, which has its roots in the Middle Ages and itself means to pray, appropriately, perhaps in a rather mechanical way. And it, relates to the pater noster, which in Latin are the first two words of the Lord's Prayer. Noster meaning our, and pater meaning father. And so Owen is sort of subverting the use of prayer here, saying that the final hasty prayers of the men will be silenced by the mechanical, glib, meaningless praying of the guns. Owen employs a couple of sound effects in this part of the poem to make the noise of the battlefield come to life. For example, he repeats the T sound in stutter, rattle and patter to create the t t t onomatopoeic sound of the guns being fired. And he also uses alliteration and short vowel sounds with rifles rapid rattle to speed up the line and therefore suggest the speed that the men were being shot at. Clearly, these sounds are very far away from the respectful sound of church bells, which announce most people's death. Now, I will just warn you that there are a number of quite dubious interpretations of the next line in sources you can find online and in print, so I'm going to give you what I think is the most accurate one. And the confusion 
is around interpreting the word mockery. And the best way I can think of defining this is as an absurd imitation of something. In other words, the prayers and bells mentioned in the second half of this line are an absurd imitation of the guns and rifles that mark the end of the lives of soldiers. And in fact, it would be ludicrously futile and pointless to hear the dignified sound of bells and prayers considering the indignity of the soldiers' deaths. There will also be no voices of mourners except for the choirs, and at this point the reader might begin to see some saving comparison with the respectful church service that most would receive at the end of their life. And the punctuation at the end of this line encourages us to pause just long enough to reflect on this before Owen gives us his meaning in full. The choirs he is referring to are the high-pitched wailing sounds of the shells, the onomatopoeia and long vowel sounds here creating an evocative image of the shells passing overhead. He personifies the shells as well, calling them demented, meaning mad, which adds to the terrifying sound that the shells must have made, while at the same time returning to another familiar theme in Owen's poetry, the madness of war. And the only other noise mentioned as part of this monstrous funeral service is the sound of bugles. And of course, bugles are recognised as a central part of a service of remembrance for those who have sacrificed themselves in war. Owen imagines this sound played from the soldier's own village or town calling out and recognising their sacrifice. The word shire here creates a deliberate contrast or juxtaposition between the mechanised theatre of war and something much more green and pastoral. The final six lines of the poem are quite complicated, but I think there are a couple of things that you can do to try and make sense of it. Uh, firstly, there is a transition of images from light to darkness, which of course represents the life going out of these soldiers. So first of all, we have images of candles that begins this section of the poem. Then a glimmer, which is a sort of weak light. Then Paul, which is dark cloud of smoke. Dusk, which is that point in the day before the light goes completely. And the final word in the poem is blinds, which on the one hand is to do with window hangings, but to be blind also means that you can't see anything, and so the light has gone out completely. This part of the poem begins with another question, which literally means, what candles will be lit and held at the funeral of these men to respectfully mark their deaths and send them swiftly to a place of rest? And the answer to this question, as with other questions in this poem, is none. There won't be any. The only sense of a goodbye they will receive is the light fading in their eyes. The word boys, which I've circled here, links, of course, to the title of the poem and reminds us again of the age of these soldiers. The imagery then moves to those back home in England, loved ones who may be pale with worry, waiting for news from those missing in action, or pale with grief. Pallor means light or pale coloured, and this echoes the end of this line through the word pall, which is the shroud laid over a coffin or funeral. Pallor is light, while a pall is dark, signalling again the transition in this part of the poem from light to darkness, from life to death. The final feature of a traditional funeral which is denied the soldiers is flowers. And instead of them, the soldiers will have the tenderness of patient minds, which is a tricky line to unpick. It's referring again to those back home in England who are waiting or grieving for loved ones. Perhaps the thoughts and memories that they have are tender, kind and gentle, and Perhaps they have to be patient while waiting for news from France, and this, rather than flowers, is the only respectful token that dying men will have. But Owen loved language. He even said that he wanted to go out to fight to preserve the language of Keats and Shakespeare, and so he would have known that the original meaning of the word patient is the bearing of suffering. And if we take this meaning of the word, then we understand how Owen is describing the thoughts of those waiting back home as both tender and painful.
The final line of this poem has another couple of images of impending darkness. It's evening, dusk, so the sun has almost set, and the blinds are being pulled down in the houses, closing out the last rays of light. And although this line can be read as the households respectfully pulling the blinds down in order to begin a period of mourning, it's also true that Owen felt increasingly separated and isolated from those who had no experience of war. And so this image of the drawing down of blind works as a metaphor for this feeling of exclusion. You can see it elsewhere in Owen's poetry. If you look at the end of Exposure, for example, you'll read the line, Shutters and doors all closed on us, the doors are closed. The alliteration in this final line, dusk a drawing down, gives it a heavy feeling and reminds us of the solemn tone of this very solemn poem.